this is where the U.S. government got an F for the pandemic. Loneliness accelerates dementia. And, and the biggest problem. threat to a good old age so is not, it's, it's not uh, good health. It's not running out of money. It's isolation. The most brain. important thing you can have is a so solid firm, social network. We already feel we're in a loneliness epidemic. One of my favorite things to do, besides making videos, of course, is to play football. I'm actually quite good. But the reason is that I always feel happy afterwards. It's about the social connection. And as someone who falls on that border of introvert, extrovert, well, actually, according to my most recent test, I am an extrovert, social connections are important irrespective of your personality type. But how important? How does it impact your health and longevity? And what can we learn from ants, the super social insects that depends on each other? And what changes can be made to mitigate this loneliness pandemic? Well, let's start with what is currently known about human health and social isolation. While I talk frequently about disease in terms of physical and functional decline, I need to remind myself of my favourite BBC bite-sized definition of health that I was taught at school, which is that health can be defined as the complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not only the absence of illness or infirmity. Emphasis here on the social well-being, as social well-being is important and there are some landmark human studies that show it. Firstly, there have been several reports linking social isolation with loneliness with high risks for health problems such as heart disease, depression, cognitive decline and mortality rates. In fact, one study found that when multidimensional assessments of social relationships were considered, the odds of mortality increased by 91% among the socially isolated. This magnitude is comparable to that of smoking and exceeds those of many other known risk factors of mortality, such as obesity and physical inactivity. So social isolation is quite simply the lack of relationships with others with little to no social support or contact. Loneliness is feeling alone or disconnected. It is feeling like you don't have meaningful or close relationships or a sense of belonging. This means that even a person with lots of friends can still feel lonely. Take a look at this other study. By combining data from four large nationally representative population-based studies using an innovative longitudinal life course design, this study provided previously unidentified causal evidence on the mechanisms linking social relationship patterns with health and longevity across the human lifespan. The more socially integrated had lower blood pressure and C-reactive protein levels. Later on in the study, they showed that it's not just about social integration and the number of friends, but also about the quality of those relationships. As you can see in these figures, it is looking at systolic blood pressure, waist circumference and body mass index, and comparing those with either low support or high support friendships, or low strain or high strain relationships at different age groups. One of the most interesting findings from the study was that having more strainful relationships had stronger associations with an increased body mass index, higher levels of the C-reactive protein, and a larger waist circumference than with the low support relationships. In other words, so the first finding, which is the quality of the relationships trumped quantity far more in terms of impact on health. But what was really the most interesting thing in the study was if you have the choice in the matter between making a new close supportive friend or getting rid of that high maintenance friend who's been like you've needed like a hole in the head for the last 30 years, the source of strain was more of an adverse effect on health than source of support being a good mm. thing on health suggesting that more stressful relationships are even worse for our health than the lack of having beneficial relationships. However, either way, it showed further evidence that there is this link between social integration, both in terms of quality and quantity, and our health. But it raises the question as to how does this lead to this increased risk of death and adverse health outcomes? Well, this is when we have to come back to the carpenter ants, a eusocial species of ants. And eusociality is, according to Wikipedia, defined as the highest level of organisation of sociality. But animals live in a group, show cooperative care of juveniles, not all individuals reproduce, and they overlap in generations. It is not just seen in ants, but bees, termites are my favourites, the naked mole rat. And it's interesting to note that the evolution of eusociality is associated with a hundredfold increase in insect lifespan compared to the equivalent species that are non-eusocial. 
But while the more logical explanation here is the fact that by living in large colonies, they are more sheltered and heavily defended against predators, it is interesting to observe that when you socially isolate one of these carpenter ants, they have a decreased lifespan. And so what they did in this very recent study is they tried to understand what was causing this decrease in the lifespan of the ants. And what they observed was that there was an increased observation of reactive oxygen species in the ants, but not just anywhere in the ants, specifically in the cells that are like liver cells, the oenocytes, and in the fat body of the ants. So this provided some evidence that it was this increased reactive oxygen species that was potentially driving the decreased lifespan. Now, there are certain compounds that are antioxidants that can help to reduce or detoxify these reactive oxygen species, such as melatonin. And so intriguingly, in this paper, they then did the experiment where they gave socially isolated ants melatonin, and it actually reduced some of the drop in lifespan caused by the isolation. Importantly, there was no change in lifespan when melatonin was given to ants that remained within the social group. Now, while I could potentially make some interesting point that melatonin is commonly taken to aid with sleep loss, and other studies have shown that socialization in Drosophila, the fruit flies, causes sleep deprivation. However, it is thought that melatonin doesn't have an involvement in the circadian rhythm in these ants. And moreover, it is unlikely that this would be an effective solution for loneliness in humans. So how do we decrease this incidence of loneliness? Well, the reason I made this video wasn't to come across as negative, because loneliness affects all of us, albeit not all of the time, necessarily, but we all feel it. Instead, I wanted to highlight that this is something that is potentially more easily indefinable and could have large benefits to our health. And interestingly, this TED talk I recommend speaks exactly on this topic, how to fight the loneliness pandemic. One of her recommendations is this. Of course, combating loneliness involves more than just forming new connections. It also requires deepening our existing connections with our colleagues, friends, and loved ones. To establish a deeper connection with someone, um, you have to openly exchange your mental contents with each other. Talk about your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and desires. We scientists call this process a conversation. (laughs) But in general, I hope that this video makes it apparent that there are simple ways that by improving social relationships, it has benefits for health. I'm fortunate that I'm still at a university where I can easily take part in team sports, but soon this might not be the case. And I like the quote from this article where it explains that we need to fundamentally rethink how societies can look beyond the medical causes of disease in an effort to promote health and well-being, and that governments can and should do much toward this goal, even during a period of economic crisis. So I will steal the ending from this TED talk, which is, instead of saying thank you for listening, I will instead say hello.